this morning. Anoint him for the words that you want to bring. May it pierce our hearts. May it change and transform us. May we all leave here different because of the word you're bringing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One, two, one, two. Yeah. One, two. We can dismiss the kids. One, two. Is this on? One, one. Here we go. Is this one on? I've got two microphones. I must be really important this morning. Well, I feel really important either way. So. This one? It's on? Hold on. RCC kids are going out while we have some... Okay. okay, cool. Well, great to see you all. This is a bit loud, so if you can turn me down a little bit. Great to see you all. We're going to continue our stewardship series um, this morning, and uh, we're on week three. I, I, I need to give you a bit of an outline as we start this thing, because otherwise it's going to feel very complicated, very convoluted, and I, I definitely don't want that. But um, I'm thinking this was the last time I get to speak on stewardship in this series, so um, I'm going to try and do a bunch of stuff this morning, right? So there's three parts to this thing. Number one, there is a sense of urgency on the church in America today, okay? Number two, stewardship is going to come down to us giving an accounting to God for what we received in this life, okay? And number three, there is an expectation for multiplication in the heart of God. Are you, are you doing Okay. Okay, so here we go. Go with me to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew was in my Bible this morning when I had devotional time, I promise you. Okay, here we go. Found it. Matthew 25. So, here we go. At that time... The kingdom of heaven will be like, this is Jesus speaking, right? At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. Just this language is very important for us, right? The bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise ones, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and for you. And instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others came along and said, Sir, sir, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Most commentators, we're going to go to the second part of this chapter in a minute, but most commentators tie these two parables together. And this parable is about a wedding feast. This parable is about a bride a bridegroom that goes to get his bride. Now, the way weddings worked in those days, a little bit differently to the way they work now. The bride got ready at her father's house. The bridegroom got ready at his father's house. And he went to go and get his bride. And he came back with his bride to his father's house. And that's when the celebration started, right? Now, we can see Jesus, and we can see the picture of what is going to happen with his church. Yeah? Because the bridegroom is away. But at some point he's coming back to collect his bride to take his bride to his father's house in heaven. Does that make sense? So this is absolutely biblical language. And it's absolutely end time language when we look at it like that. The, 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 the important part for us here, two things. Number one, he was a long time coming. He was a long time coming back. And so it says there that these ten ladies got drowsy. Right? And then verse 10, when he comes back, the door shut. Right? Now we've been talking about this, this sense of urgency. And anytime there's a hard stop, there has to be a sense of urgency. Right? When you're writing finals, at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, your final starts. You're either ready or you're not. There's a hard stop. Does that make sense? 
If you're leaving to go somewhere, I'm flying to North Carolina on Wednesday to go and minister in a church down there. On Wednesday morning, I'm either in my seat in that airplane or I'm not when the door closes. Does that make sense? It's a hard stop. And what we've got to understand about eternity and about Jesus coming back for his bride, at some point there's going to be a hard stop. The limitless grace of God has an end time. Because when Jesus comes back, your name either is in the Lamb's book of life or it isn't. Grace runs out. There's a hard stop to limitless grace. Are you doing okay? And when the church forgets that, like these ten ladies, some of them, when the church forgets that, we get drowsy, we get distracted, we fall asleep. Does that make sense? And so then when the bridegroom comes for his bride, when that hard stop arrives, we're not ready for it. Now nobody knows when that is. I'm not prophesying about end times. I'm just using this as an illustration to explain why we are feeling a sense of urgency in this nation right now. There are other hard stops. It doesn't have to be the return of Christ. Although I believe the church can never lose sight of the fact that Jesus is coming back. We never can. But there can be other things that can run out. The freedoms that we have in this nation can run out. Are you you doing okay? There can be some other things. And so there's this great sense of urgency on us. There's a sense of urgency on the elders. The elders have felt it at different times for different things. We prayed about it on Tuesday night. The church loses sight of the fact that Jesus is coming back. The church becomes lazy, distracted, and lethargic. This is not the time in America for churches or believers to be asleep at the wheel when it comes to their faith. Same old, same old. Business as usual. We'll just get on with it. We'll just live our lives. It's not the time for that. COVID set many believers backwards and many churches backwards. I spoke to a buddy of mine in California after COVID. He said they lost 26 leaders. He said he had four full worship teams. Right now, he doesn't have a single worship team. COVID set believers and churches back. Set that church back. Right? Set believers back. Because believers became lethargic and lazy. And we believed we could be part of a church, sitting on our couch, in our PJs on a Sunday morning, watching the live feed. I'm telling you, you cannot. You cannot. That word, koinonia, Not the weakened version of that thing, sitting around singing Kumbaya, my Lord, picking fluff out of each other's belly buttons. The essence of that word, the called out ones, the called together ones, the called for a purpose ones. You cannot do that sitting on your couch in your PJs. It's time for the church in America to get back to its purpose of church planting, of multi-siting, of reaching out again with the gospel, of trusting God for his anointing and his authority to come over us as we deal with these things. Are you doing okay? We're not going to do that sitting on the couch in our PJs. That's why we stopped our live feed. Well, Tim agrees with me. The rest of you are kind of like, (laughs) the rest of you are kind of like, man, this guy feeling salty this morning. He had a lot of flavors to choose from this morning and he chose salty. No, I didn't. There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of urgency. Are we doing okay? Just help me out, friends. Are we doing okay? There's something about us getting back together and getting on with the purpose of God. Getting on with what God's called us to. The bar was lowered during COVID. We couldn't gather. So we did those things. But now we can gather. I don't want to be so bold as to say COVID's over, but we can gather. A lot of those restrictions are over, and we have to get back together, back on purpose, back on mission, because there's a hard stop coming. And that should give us a sense of urgency in what we're about. Are you doing okay? Number two. Stewardship is about giving an account. Let's read the rest of that Well, the second part of that parable, there's actually three. We're not going to go to the third one. Uh, This is a bit of a longer... Okay, here we go. 
the parable of the talents. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. Now, when he says again, he's rephrasing verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of God will be like. And so, verse 14 could read the same way. Again, the kingdom of God will be like. A man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to one one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went out at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the one who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, remember the first story, the the bridegroom was a long time coming. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. We are going to be given an account when Jesus returns. The man who had received the five talents said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came and said, Master, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to him. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that a harvest we have not sown, gather we have not scattered. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. When I returned, it would have been received back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Such a powerful story as well. And you can see how those two uh, parables mirror each other. Some commentators tie those parables together, right? Like the, the, the Luke 15 chapter that Ty quoted. You know, the, 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 how does it start? The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Right? We tell that as three parables, but it's one story. And remember, a parable is this. It's a simple story that conveys a powerful truth. That's what a parable is. It's a simple story. And so yeah, we have a simple story about men that were entrusted with the goods of their master. And how when the master returned, they had to give an accounting for it. And like the kingdom of God, this is what this is about. It is about Jesus going on a journey and at some point coming back and demanding an accounting from his sons, servants, and stewards. What did you do with what I left you while you were away? Are you doing okay? I'm going to read you three versions of that first verse. The NIV, the 1984 version, says it like this. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. The NIV, more modern version, says this. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. The New Living Translation says this, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. So I want to say this, friends. We've we've covered two weeks of this stewardship series and we haven't really spoken about money a lot. Today is going to be about money. We're going to try and learn some things about what God expects from us, right? The man going away represents Jesus, says Michael Eaton. And the implication here is that Jesus is going to return and ask for an accounting of what he did. Warren Wiersbe says this, that a talent was worth 20 years wages. So we can learn something about that. We can say this, like actually this is a lot of money. But the second lesson that we can learn about that is this is a lifetime. This is a lifetime's worth of of gifts, talents, etc. Does it make does it make sense? So it's like there's a it's a lot of money. There's an amount there, but there's also a time element to that. This is 20 years. This is a lifetime. We don't know how long the master was away, but we know they were entrusted with a lifetime's worth of earnings. 
So this isn't about like, what am I going to do this month or next month? This is about what am I going to do with my life? And so when we understand that, it has to lead us to ask ourselves this question, what will we do with what God has given us in our lives while he is away? And when he returns, will we hear good and faithful servant or wicked lazy servant? There doesn't seem to be middle ground there. There doesn't seem to be a participation trophy. I'm just trying to keep preaching and not go to meddling, but preach it, baby, my wife says. Listen, when my wife tells me to preach it, y'all in trouble, let me tell you right now. Because she's normally the one going, hey, babe, just like. There doesn't seem to be a middle ground. Are we okay with that story? Are we okay with how we've explained those two parables? Right? There's an urgency and there's an accounting. There's an urgency because there's a hard stop. And there's an accounting because God has trusted us with much. Are you doing okay? So I want to say this, friends. God has ways. God expects multiplication. Remember, that's the third part of where we're going now, right? God has multiplication in his heart. It's built into the DNA of creation. We started in Genesis, how God gave man fruit uh, with seed in it. There's a multiplication built into the DNA of creation. And God is the creator. And we are part of that DNA in terms of multiplication as well. Just in terms of the human race. Are you doing doing okay? So God has multiplication in his heart. But he has ways for that multiplication to work out. Genesis chapter 8 tells us this. Seed time and harvest. And it says this. That as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest will not cease. Genesis 8. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest will not cease. Isaiah 26, I believe it is, talks about a farmer doesn't just keep plowing. Doesn't just keep plowing. He plows, puts seed in the ground, and expects a harvest. Are you doing okay? From Genesis all the way through to the New Testament. Galatians 6 tells us what we sow is what we reap. And adds an even stronger thing to that when it says what we sow is what we reap. God cannot be mocked. So in other words, if you sow something and don't reap it, God is mocked. Also, if you don't sow it and expect to reap it, you're mocking God. Are 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 you doing okay this morning? So can we have that slide up? This is, a, this is a thing that God showed me a while, but I just want to, I want to point this out first. Because I, Christ, I asked Christine to make this slide for me, and then I asked her to go get me a laser pointer, and this is the laser pointer she got me. Perfect. In case you can't see that, it's a little mouse with a little curly tail, and the button that you have to push to get the laser pointer to work is a little pink heart. What are you clapping for? <laughs> it's a church mouse. So I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know if we should just close. I don't know at that point if we should just close in prayer and call it a day. I don't know, I don't know what to do. But anyway. Christine. You are a bright light, my girl. You bring joy and lightness wherever you go. So even in this little thing, there's a joy to it. So even if it's joy at my expense, it's still joy. So I'm happy. I'm happy. All right. So here we go. This is something that I believe God showed me about 20 years ago. Andrew and I worked on this thing together. And so here you can see something here, right? Remember we said God has ways right and when we look here this is the right we tithe we give in other words we've sown like i said we cannot it's not in the heart (laughs) i want to hold this in such a way so that you can see the mouse when i'm pointing at it (laughs) but we sow and god does not expect us just to sow and sow and sow 
There is not that expectation. The expectation is seed time and harvest. So when we sow, we reap. When we reap, we have the resources to fulfill our vision. To see churches planted, to see multi-sites, to see what God has called us to do. As Tyrant said, not always ahead of us. Church planting and multi-siting is not something that is going to happen in the next 10 years. It's happening for us right now. Right now. Does that make sense? And so there's this life cycle here to money that when we put ourselves in this circle, that's what we look like. But there's also an opposing circle to this. When we withhold, we consume the seed, you will never consume your way out of a famine. I'm going to touch on this a little bit tonight down south. Isaac in the land of famine. And then later it says Isaac sowed seed in that land. In which land? In the land of famine. There's only one way out of a famine. There's only one way out of need. And that's to sow yourself out of it. You can't consume yourself out of it. If you consume the seed by implication. Listen, everything God makes a seed in except these days. These days they engineer and you can buy oranges without seed and watermelon without seed. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about everything that God created had seed and the possibility for that seed is endless if it is sown. How many oranges are in an orange seed? Well, if you plant that orange seed and it becomes a tree, they are limitless. And then if you take those seeds and plant, can you see what I'm saying? That's God's DNA for multiplication. But it has to be sown. It has to be sown. And if you withhold and you consume, you're in famine, you're in need, and then that leads you to withholding again. And so we've got to acknowledge, we either set ourselves up for this life cycle, or we set ourselves up for this cycle. Are are you doing okay? This is how the Bible puts it. Can you leave that up? Just leave that up for a little while. This is how the Bible puts it. Jesus himself says this, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now we need to understand where that word comes from, right? It was the ancient Assyrians who were the first to establish banks, banking systems and interest, right? Principles that our banks still run on today. When they set up those banks, they set up a God, little g, God, to oversee that banking system and those financial principles. And that God's name was Mammonus. Now that's where we get our English word money from. It's not a hard jump. Mammonus. And the currency was mammon, money. Are are you doing okay? So this is not about like, well, I'm serving money. No, it's about another God. It's about a level of idolatry. Because there's a God that is set up to oversee this system. And there is a God that oversees this system. And there's only one way to get our money out of that system and into this system, and that is to tithe, to sow, to give. Does that that make sense? While you're withholding, you're playing in mammon's realm, and then mammon is set up, Mammonus is set up as the God and the authority over that money. Are you, are you doing, I'm just trying to help you this morning, right? I'm trying to help you with my little pink mouse. That's why scripture says we cannot serve God and money. Cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God, the creator of the universe, and mammonus. You cannot serve them. They are incompatible. Right? Because this is mammonus God, the creator of the universe. And we get to make a decision which system we put our money in. Simple as that. Simple as that. When we tithe, we acknowledge that God owns it all, not mammon. When we tithe, we establish an authority structure that says God is in control, not mammon. When we tithe, we remove another area of idolatry from our lives. And acknowledge that God is our first true love and that we serve Him and Him alone. When we establish the tithe, we are stating that we believe in God's financial system, not mammon's. 
When we establish the tithe, we establish God's plan of multiplication. And when we establish the tithe, we say we are agreeing with God's financial principles. Are we doing okay? Let's land with this. There's an urgency on the church right now. There's an urgency for believers to get their finances in order. I've told you this, we're running Financial Peace University and uh, in the fall, see Jeff afterwards, Jeff waved us, see Jeff afterwards. If you haven't gone through Financial Peace University or you haven't done it for a little while, I would strongly suggest it. Their tools and their budget tools, I use them personally. It, it just is an amazing way to govern your finances to know where your finances are going, all of those kind of things, which I'm telling you now is going to be more and more important for believers in our nation, in our day. Yeah. Are you doing okay? Stewardship is about delegated authority. The authority to manage everything God brings to our lives until He returns. Yeah. And to give an accounting to Him when He returns. Yeah. It's about stewarding his resources, his resources in such a way as to bring in a worldwide harvest and to bring glory to his name. What could be more exciting than that? What could be more exciting than that? Here's the thing. The one talent guy. The one talent guy. For us is the focus of the story. Right? Wesby says it like this. He says, the guy that received the one talent might have thought it was not really important in the light of how much the other guys received. So this guy gets five, this guy gets two, I get one. So I go, well, that's not really important. My, my little paycheck's not really important. Right? Those guys over there, those guys with the money, it's the, clearly this stuff's important to them. Clearly it's important to them. Because if you're earning millions, you don't want to waste millions. If you're earning hundreds of thousands, you don't want to waste hundreds of thousands. But for me, it's not really important. The importance did not come from the amount. The importance came from the fact that it was entrusted to him by his master. And so the master becomes important, not the amount. Are you doing okay? And so that gives all of us in this room context. Because we can all go, wait, hang on a minute. The point here is not the amount. The point is I've been entrusted with something by my master. Yeah. I've been entrusted with something from Jesus. Yes. And it is Jesus that makes that amount important, not the amount that makes the amount important. Yeah. Yeah. Are you doing okay? So nobody gets away from this. We, we, we make grave mistakes when we go, when I've got money, I'll do this. You'll never have money. Why not? Because you're in the system. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's only one way to break out of that system. And that's why these two things are tied together there. That's the breaking point. That's the breaking point. That's how you break out of this and break into this. Are you doing okay? I was sitting in, Hol in, a, in a Starbucks on Hollywood Boulevard about 10 years, 20 years ago. And so... We, we had just immigrated to America. I was doing something downtown Hollywood and I had a couple of hours to waste. So I went and sat in, in the Starbucks in Hollywood Boulevard and I'm like, man, this, like, I knew Hollywood was weird, but this is weird, right? There are pixies and goblins and witches and all kinds of things in the Starbucks. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. And while all these pixies and weirdos are all around me, this is what God spoke to me about out of Isaiah 55, my ways are higher than your ways. This is not rules. This is the ways of God. This is God's way. This is God's way to ensure that his heart for multiplication works out. This is God's way to ensure that the church is resourced for the vision that God has given it. Not bake sales and money collections and special offerings. Just God's people taking care and stewarding the resources that he has given them. Now I was 20... 20 plus years ago, we were very fresh in America. And Halloween was not a big thing in South Africa. 
And I realized that I was in this Starbucks on Hollywood Boulevard on Halloween, and that's what was going on. But while all of this stuff's going along, along with me, this is what God showed me. It's been something that we've taught from time to time. Like I said, Andrew and I worked on this thing. I wish he was here. He's away on vacation. I just don't understand elders going away on vacation while people are going to hell. But anyway, that's between them and the Lord. <laughs> September. <laughs> Okay, 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 stop digging, yeah. <laughs> Sandy's so funny, she's going, you ask them to take vacation. <laughs> doing okay friends this is about a simple understanding for us that jesus is returning when he returns we're going to give an account and in the meantime we are called to steward his resources and get on with the job of ensuring that his gospel gets to the ends of the earth you doing okay let's stand together friends tell me you want to pray for us but come on up faithful stewards, Lord. Help us to be the ones that you say, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. And so we just uh, pray your blessing over each one here this, this morning as they uh, go about their day. Um, thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in RCC and around the world for your kingdom's sake. We bless you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Do stick around. Chapter name.